So good audio. Hello. Mic check. Mic check. Hello. 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 Mic check. Hello. JD sir. JD sir. He left the room. One of the room left. Hello. हेलो हेलो माइक चेक हेलो हेलो माइक चेक नहीं अभी तो पार्टिसिपेंट हेलो हेलो माइक चेक कुछ भी नहीं हेलो
शुरू करते हैं ओके सो या इट्स अ प्लेजर टू हैव ऑल ऑफ यू बैक हियर अगेन विथ वन ऑफ आवर ओन मेंबर्स कमिंग बैक टू द इंस्टीट्यूट फॉर अ कोलोकियम uh so i would like to welcome professor naresh patwari who is a professor at the department of chemistry in iit bombay not very far away in fact you can uh, listening after listening to his talk you can visit his lab at some point of time um so that's the convenience of it um but uh, just wanted to give you a brief uh, sort of background uh, for naresh's expertise and uh, his uh, previous education so naresh uh, actually did his undergraduate studies um uh, at usmania university and after earning a bsc in 1992 he moved to university of hyderabad to complete his masters degree uh which he finished in 1994 subsequently he enrolled for the doctoral program in uh, uh, our institute at uh, tifr mumbai um and he actually did his phd work with professor sanjay watekaunkar um a uh, well known person in gas phase spectroscopy uh, uh who was here till i think 2019 2020 so uh, naresh was actually the first student of sanjay uh, phd student um and then after finishing um his phd in 2000 he did postdoc uh, work at tohoku university where he uh, was a jsps fellow from 2000 to 2002 um and then he did, had a post doctoral short post doctoral stint at albana champagne uh after which he actually joined um iit bombay as an assistant professor in 2003 um he rose up to the ranks because of his wonderful work and um he has been there since um as a professor now and um his work has en- encompassed a lot of different aspects of hydrogen bonding uh of course he has changed um lots of uh, areas subject areas he has gone from an experiment he has gone from an ex- a completely a pure uh, physical chemist experimental physical chemist to now he has added on to his repertoire also computational chemistry so he has actually engaged quite a bit in theoretical chemistry and computational chemistry to understand the the problems that are necessary uh, to sort of appreciate different kinds of weak interactions and of course uh, condensed phase dynamics um for his wonderful work in uh, sort of widening the understanding of fundamental concepts of hydrogen bonding naresh was given the shanti swarup bhatnagar prize in 2017 so without further ado naresh it's a pleasure thank you for coming here and giving this colloquium it's your place so thank you jd uh, wanted to say that all of the things that you have said are factually correct so you didn't have to use word actually so many times <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, i must tell you uh, my apologies to uh, my good friend uh, jd that i'm going to talk about ground state phenomena you know for jd anything he touches must get excited so he works on excited state mostly but for me you know ground state is good enough okay in fact uh okay uh to begin with i mean i was looking at you know some nice uh, i had this uh, title decided for a while but i was trying to look for a, a caricature to tell what exactly it was doing and then i found this one so essentially something has to kick the proton away and in next 40 minutes or so i will try to tell what our understanding about this proton kicking is about okay and then a uh, couple of uh, and there is a coincidence and there is this you know uh, movie a 2010 movie atithi kab jaoge i thought i can rephrase it proton tum kab jaoge so it's kind of a, a question that we have been trying to ask and i hope at the end of an hour i'll be able, okay 40 minutes sorry uh, i'll be able to convince you that you know we have at least uh, try to answer that question that i'm asking in its title okay and i'm an experimentalist uh, i was trained experimentalist by sanjay right here in this institute but uh, if you're an experimental physical chemist one thing that you must always do is also build models and uh, build models that come from not only your da- data from your own lab but you know data across many many labs and one should have a universal picture of what is churning out 
So this uh, question that we are asking is one such question where you know, we looked at data across many, many uh, labs, okay? And try to make a model that kind of explains this proton transfer reaction. So uh, you can't, I mean, it's, it's just a model building and I chose my favorite tools to do that. Uh, we can debate about it, but otherwise, you know, uh, Oh, by the way, I have not said at any slide, in any, at any part of slide, what what kind of calculations I did. Nothing is actually there, uh, but it's just a model. I, it could be right, it could be wrong. You could have your own take. I have no problem with that because it's just a model. And uh, if you have, uh, if you want details, of course, I would be happy to talk to you. Okay. Audience, you have taken care of some. Previous data, model yes, 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 yes. It's all based on it's data driven. Okay. Okay. Uh, here are the three uh, important uh, papers or talks that I let me into this field. Okay. One is this paper uh, by Martina Hevnitz group from Bochum. Uh, the this paper I was published in Science in two thousand nine. Okay. It said that for HCl molecule to dissociate and form H plus and Cl minus, it must be assisted by four water molecules. And what they call it in this case is that smallest droplet of acid. And there was this another paper by a Japanese French collaborative group. They said that if you take phenol and put it in ammonia, what it takes to transfer the proton from phenol to ammonia. This is an experimental paper. And more interestingly, uh, this is the title of the talk, okay, in a meeting that my good friend Sain Bakchi from NCL Pune gave back in 2014. And I was trying to make connections between these papers and this talk, okay. And the buzzword here was this electrostatic field, okay. So we thought at this point out when I heard this talk, uh, of course, this talk originated from this work that uh, Sain Bakchi did at Steve Boxer Lab at uh, Stanford. So we thought if we can somehow make connections between these experimental papers and the concepts that Steve Boxer was talking about, then we would un probably understand. Of course, I didn't know that we would understand that. Probably understand that what proton transfer might be. When you talk of proton transfer, the first thing that comes to our mind is Grothus mechanism. Grothus mechanism is when you have an excess proton, how the proton moves along the water chain. Okay. For example, you can see in the beginning, the proton is on that water molecule and by slowly rotating and transferring, it ends on the last molecule. Okay. So while it is doing that, there is a, there is a rotate hop, rotate, kind of a, a transformation that in, it undergoes. Okay? But by the way, Grothus mechanism was given in 1806. And first real attempt, okay, uh, by the, uh, uh, I'll come back to that. So there was this review art article uh, published a few years back, okay? And it goes on to give order to Grothus mechanism and what are the problems associated with the age-old Grothus mechanism and what could be improved on that. But, and they use this similar mechanism when you can transport a proton along a gramicidin, which is nothing but a uh, ion channel. And you can transport, not only gramicidin is known for transporting of potassium ions, but in this case, they showed using uh, molecular dynamic simulation that it can also transfer a proton through the gramicidin. But Rothas mechanism was in 1806. But a serious attempt at the structure of water was given in 1892. So you can see it the Grothus mechanism preceded water structure by almost 86 years. I mean, if you now think the, geni uh, the genius of Grothus to have thought about Grothus mechanism, okay, is that he didn't even know what water looked like. Okay, and just based on the fact that the proton hops much, much faster in water than many other solvents, he could propose this mechanism, okay? In fact, I would, I, should, I mean, I don't know, I'm a chemist, but if you don't know, I mean, one of the 
if you have read chemistry at any, at any level, maybe under, undergraduate level or even 12th class or, uh, or at high school level, you'll know that the structure of benzene was given by, you know, Kekulé's dream that, you know, the, uh, the snake was eating its own tail. In fact, this story is even far better than that. Okay, at least when Kekulé, the, the concept of atoms and a molecular structure was known, but during Grotha's, Grotha's time, that was not even known. So in that sense, Grotha's mechanism preceded it by century, um, at least by a century. Okay. okay, and then came the hydrogen bond. Okay, even though structure of water, uh, the concept of hydrogen bond. The reason why I use this hydrogen bond because to transfer a proton, you will have to form hydrogen bonds. Okay, so hydrogen bond is kind of a a parent to a proton transfer reaction. Uh, there can be no proton, uh, there can, okay, this is a statement emphatically that there cannot be a proton transfer reaction without forming a hydrogen bond, period. Now, the concept of hydrogen bond, though didn't call it hydrogen bond, because that word was coined by Linus Pauling much later in the 1930s, but this concept was given as early as 1920. Uh, during pandemic, we had this 100 years of hydrogen, there's a meeting called 100 years of hydrogen bonding, at the uh, Indian Institute of Science, and there is a nice volume of papers collected from the talks that we had given in that meeting, but it's 100 year old now, little more than 100, four years more than that. But the cons, so essentially I'm trying to put the structure of water, the hydrogen bonding, and the proton transfers together to have a kind of a uh, unified picture as to when I have a hydrogen bonding, question is, will it do it or won't it? Okay, now question is that if hydrogen bond forms, will it transfer a proton or won't it? And I should tell with 100% accuracy, when will it? So that's the point, of course, uh, empirical never works 100%, but to a statistically significant number of times, I should be able to tell when would I transfer the proton and when I won't not not me, the molecules, okay. Uh, so one of the early attempts uh, to understand transport, okay, uh, through uh, water chains, okay. Uh, Gramicidin just happens to be a case, but you know, you can, you can take it with a pinch of salt. But the reason why uh, Gramicidin becomes very important, because the structure of water being, you know, uh, organized. When you have an organized water structure, you can see, if I can go back to my very first slide, you see the water is you know, organized in some fashion for the Grotha's mechanism to push protons from to one end from the other end. So in that sense, gramicidine is a good example because of the uh, hydrophilic insights of this uh, uh, channel protein. The water is such as assigned such that at one end you have a low binding affinity for potassium, and at the other end you have hive, and there is a gradient of binding affinity so that the potassium ion switches from the one side to the others. This just happens because of the organization of water along the gramicidine uh, uh, pore. Okay. And, uh, water wires are essentially, you know, if uh, it's like it's water wires are essentially if you hold hands and a you know, few people stand in a line, okay, then I would call it a wire, but of humans. So what water wires are just waters held by one against okay, with hydrogen bonds, especially in a linear fashion. But does it happen uh, generally, if you take liquid water, they don't exist. Uh, I mean, their probability is very, very low. So you need some kind of scaffold to make that happen. So in this case, of course, the gramicidine. Uh, uh, the pore of the gramicidine has that scaffold in which you can line up waters, uh, maybe about 20 of them, so that you know there is an increased affinity to the potassium ion from one end to the other end. So essentially, it's an affinity gradient. So at this end, if you can think of lower end, this is lower end is a, a low affinity and upper end is high affinity. So if I draw this,
the SNT would look like that. So the SNT at the bottom end would be lowest and the top end would be the highest. Okay, as, I, as the potassium end progresses the channels and there must be some reason why the potassium end has to move. So that is the, just the affinity. And more, it's not the potassium. So you can think potassium is just a positively charged species. So is a proton. But proton has its own issues. But one can think of this conceptually to tell that there must be a scaffold that will allow to move things in unidirectionally. Okay. But gramicidin is not only... Uh, then there are many, many proton transfer reactions in biology. Okay, uh, one of them is this uh, catasteroid isomerase. So if you, if you, uh, some steroids are harmful, so you have to isomerize them for making them. So one of them is ketosteroid isomerase, an enzyme that has some isomerase. Essentially, it's a proton relay mechanism. It takes, it puts in a proton at one place and takes out the proton at some other place. In the meanwhile, you have rearranged structure. And there are a uh, lot of uh, uh, DNA biology has uh, protonated and deprotonated structures, which cause mutations. Uh, there are papers on it. I'm not going to talk about that's not what I want, but essentially. The other molecule that has, which actually stops proton moving is aquaporins. Aquaporins are these proteins that allow uh, to stay as hydrated, okay? Because the cell, the cell wall is completely hydrophobic, so the water cannot go. So you need, you know, some kinds of taps. Otherwise, you'll get dehydrated. You need some taps to let in water and equilibrate with respect to whatever they want. So aquaporins are the uh, aquaporins are class of where water permeates but not protons. And this work by Arya Warshall showed that the the if you want to transfer a proton in the aquaporin cavity, the barrier is so high that it doesn't, even the water is prearranged, okay? Exactly opposite of gramicidine. In gramicidine, water is prearranged, lets you uh, transfer the proton, but in aquaporine, water is arranged, but doesn't let you transfer the proton, okay? So essentially, you know, you can now think of scaffolds that will on, uh, in one cases, that will allow the transfer, proton transfer to happen and other, so there must be some very simple answers that one should be able to provide why in some cases we will transfer protons. It does, again, you can think of structured water. In one case, in gramicidine, structured water allows you to transfer the proton. And in gramicidine, uh, sorry, in the case of aquaporins, it doesn't. So what determines? A very simple question. Why in one case and why not in the other case? Oh, OK. Now, uh, I'll come back to this paper that I talked about by uh, Heavenage Group in Bochum. There is some controversy about this paper, as many papers that are public get published in you know, high quality, high impact fact journal. So, in fact, uh, there was a subsequent paper which shows that this paper is wrong. Okay. Uh, but uh, there are some take home lessons. The take home lessons are that. If I want to, if HCl has to transfer its proton, mock up, become H plus and Cl minus, you will need four water molecules. That is kind of a universal truth that comes out of this paper. And what it says that the way this experiment is done is in a technique called pickup. Okay? So you have a large uh, droplet of helium in which you add one molecule at a time. So what they say is once you have three waters and one HCl, it's not ready to transfer a proton. You take fourth water molecule, hit it like a billiards ball, and then proton transfer happens spontaneously. Okay, and that's what this experiment says. Uh, uh, experiment, I want to say, but it doesn't. But this is what you no, know, this computationally they have shown, and there are ways to tell that it has to happen. You know, like you can play billiards between molecules inside this helium droplets, uh, which is another story uh, for some other day. But we looked at this data a little more carefully and said, okay, uh, slightly differently. It says that let's take an HCl and put, okay, if it, if it can do for four water molecules, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it can certainly do for, okay. it can certainly do it for five molecules, okay? Now, when we looked at this, uh, 
the conformational space or configurational space around HCl with five water molecules arranged, you'll see when I arrange, when the five molecules are of water arranged in this fashion, HCl molecules still intact. But if I arrange in this fashion, you can see that the, it has lost a proton and your formation of H3O plus. Okay. So what it tells us is that it's just not water molecules number, it's how they are arranged. And there are more examples. For, in, for instance, this is for formic acid, in which case if you arrange six, one, two, three, four, five, six, this six, seven water molecules like this versus this, this is no and this is yes. So the proton transfer. So essentially, which means you can take X number of water molecules and now start, the, start looking at the configurational space that they generate around the solute. And some configurations will allow proton transfer and some configurations won't. But one way of looking at these configurations is charge distribution. Okay, now if I think of, uh, in this case, some solute molecule, that in this case, this green ball is surrounded by water. Now what it is doing is it is surrounded by some electrostatics and this electrostatics is going to change the moment I change the configuration around it. And this configurational space or the electrostatics that emerges out of this configuration space must somehow code for the fact that the proton transfer will happen or not happen. Okay, now the question, yes. This one. Oh, uh, those are ab initio calculations. Okay, and we had our own method to generate, uh, right, different clusters. Okay. Uh, want details, I'll give you the details of how we did it. Okay. okay. Uh, so, essentially, what it is, so somehow, if we can, uh, of course, it's there, the, it, the answer lies there, but somehow if you can extract that answer and tell that, okay, now I have, if I have this value or whatever that number is, I mean, I don't know the number, this property, if I have that number or a property, then I should be able to transfer proton and otherwise. So it should be a case of binary, yes or no, okay? So one of the things we thought, because proton transfer is just, you know, let's think of, there are, for HCl, it's very simple. There is a H Cl bond, and then you move this, you stretch the HCl bond, and at some point of time, it will become H plus and Cl minus. So by the way, it can also become H dot and uh, the radicals. Okay, but that uh, in the solute, uh, if you do it in the gas phase, it will become H dot and Cl dot. But if you do in presence of a uh, polar solvent, it would actually become H plus and Cl minus. Okay. Then we said, if you have this, electro, uh, this electrostatic field, let's project this field along the direction of that bond and create an electric field and you know some sort of a number, okay? And then, of course, it's very easy, you know, uh, classical electrostatics, uh, one can get the uh, potential at each point and take a derivative of that potential, you'll get a field and that field will be along this direction of the protic group. So HCl has just one bond, but I, I'll talk about, I told you phenol, no? it is a polyatomic molecule. So uh, it should still work because you are only transferred the proton with respect to the molecule. But we were not the first one to think of such a uh, possibility. So way back in 1992, Peter Kim's group uh, published this paper where they said if you have an alpha, alpha helix and alpha helix has uh, dipoles arranged in one fashion and this creates an electric field that can have a stark effect if you have a chromophore attached to it. Okay, So what they showed is that if you attach a chromophore to an alpha helix, its absorption spectrum shifts. Okay, And they found that by denaturing this alpha helix, whereby you know, helix is not intact, so the, you have lowering of the field, then one can reduce this shift in the uh, absorption spectrum. And this they demonstrated, I think this paper was published in 1992, very old. Uh, hundreds of megavolt per centimeter. Okay, I'll come to those numbers in a minute. 
Okay, so it's not that. I mean, back now, I mean, if you say in, if you use this word internal electric fields, you'll get thousands and thousands of papers. Okay, and so I, I don't want to claim that he did it for the first time. And there was this another set of paper by Steve Boxer, uh, who I was talking to Sian Bakshi's talk. I mean, I borrowed these ideas from Sian Bakshi's talk. Essentially, borrowed ideas from Steve Boxer, and I said that we, who said that if you mock, if you make hydrogen bonds. And one can estimate, okay, so you, you can think of it like this. If I, have an, if I have an oscillator, okay, and it's oscillating, and now, and this oscillator, if you think in terms of potential surfaces, must come from the, how the electrons and nuclei are distributed. Now we have put an electric field to it. The nuclei, uh, the position of the nuclei and the electrons will shift, and this will lead to a different oscillators set of oscillators and there will be shift in this oscillator. Very simple thinking. And one can think of, one can do a first order perturbation correction to that. And then look at what is the new oscillator. And then you can look at the, how much it has shifted. And they calculated how much they have shifted. And they showed that for a majority, it's a linear uh, shift between the field and the oscillator, uh, the shift in the oscillator frequency versus the field. And it can, if it becomes stronger, there are you know, non-linear effects as well, okay, which they didn't talk about. You can see that in some cases, they fit straight lines only to the part of the data. And the other part, they said that there is this, I'll come back to this Kita steroid isomerize, in which they said that if I now put this molecule and there is a carbonyl stretch, C double bond O, okay, uh, in this case, and they, and what they did was they tried to calculate, uh, uh, experimentally determine this uh, CO switching frequency for the wild type and uh, several mutants. And with respect to their calibration curve, they determined how much is going to be, uh, the, uh, what the shift would responsible in terms of electrostatic fields. And it turns out that they said that electrostatic field is about 200 to 250 megavolt per centimeter. Okay. But after this paper was published, there was a uh, comment on this paper in which it says that, you know, uh, Steve Boxer oversold this idea. Of course, if you write a paper there's a, in science, there is someone who's going to rebut it if he doesn't like it. So that's what happened, some bigger. So, but that doesn't matter to us, okay? Because we are not really interested whether it is a, a, a mod, I'm looking, Suma, I'm just looking at a model building which makes sense of the data that we are trying to look at. So to our O'Day with this, started with this electric fields and hydrogen bonds, because that's what was known. You know, everybody was talking about hydrogen bond. So we looked at water and methanol. Okay? And we looked at how this field in various, if, you, if I take a water inside uh, some water pool and say, I take, okay, I pick one water out of this water pool and say, hey, what is the field you are experiencing? Okay, And if you do this for many, many such water molecules, what you see is a large spread of frequency fields which go from 25 to 250 megavolt per centimeter. The ones water molecules that are on surface are experiencing, experiencing lower uh, electric fields, but one that are in the bulk. And not only that, it depends on the configuration. So water can form two hydrogen bonds, like there are two hydro, uh, HS, so these can give away hydrogen bonds but there are two lone pairs, rabbit ears, which are forming hydrogen bonds. So those are called double donor, double acceptor, okay? So there are these motifs that water, okay, motor, water has a lot of hydrogen bonding motifs, and some of these motifs have some extraordinary properties, okay? And, but unfortunately, in the, when you come to methanol, because you put one CH3 group, this number of motifs go down, and that's why you see the spread has gone down, okay? So, be, now I can see, okay, by the way, this is after one because I've been looking at this data for many, many years. That, that We didn't say this in the paper when we published, but now I know better of it. So because you inc inc decrease the number of motifs in the methanol, the, you can see the spread is smaller when compared to the uh, water. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, I'll come to water ionization in just a minute, okay? Uh, right, so here comes the problem, okay? Right, exactly where you are asked. Now, if I think very simply, 
what is pka i mean if you know what if you if you are a biologist or if you are a biochemist or a chemist you know this concept of pka which is nothing but negative logarithm of the uh, association of gas so i define pka something like this okay it's essentially uh, you take k as the concentration of proton excess proton that you generate which is solvated versus an un un undissociated one and it will be z because it's a logarithmic if the numerator and denominator are same one same then that value will be and pk will be zero okay now zero uh, by the way ph scale is defined from 1 to 14 okay zero means you know you have equal number of uh, protons and non protons of of a given uh, okay. now less than 1 and then there are definitions but for water pk is 14 and if i convert this back that means on the thermodynamic scale I should be able to get about this much high, 80 kilojoule per mole. Okay, uh, I'm now switching the units. I'm no longer talking about electric fields. Okay, uh, the reason is very simple. I want to connect this number to the electric field at some point of time. It says that the water, the water auto dissociates to H plus and OH minus. If I were to do this, it needs 80 kilojoule per mole higher in energy. Okay, and if I pK 14 simply means it's a rare event. That means if I take 10 power 14 configurations, only one of those configurations would have lost a proton. Okay, so one in 10 power 14. And we know Nyquist theorem, and we says that if you want to catch it, I must at least sample the double amount of time. So which means I have to sample two into 10 power 14 configurations to be able to catch one of them dissociating. Okay, so essentially it's a no go. Okay, so this remains an open problem because this is one of the problems in the uh, what I call it as I was talking to Ravi this uh, morning is is sampling. Okay, you need to sample so much. Okay, and there are some estimates. You will need eleven hours of real time simulation. Okay, I I don't know what that really means. I mean probably if if I start. I don't know how many generations would need to get that job done. Okay. But there must be some way to look at this problem. Otherwise, you know, so we'll come to that. Okay. Now, the other question that I say is that, okay, water is a difficult thing to handle because uh, there's no way in my lifetime I can sample 10 power 14 configuration. So I will not look at it the way I want, the way this problem is faced, but I can rephrase that problem in some other way. Before that, I want to phrase a much simpler problem which I can solve it within my lifetime. Naresh, there was an issue with the previous slide. If you go back to the slide, you have missed the salt. Your oh, concentration no, no. PK, of the salt. No, PK is defined this way. No, no, but your concentration no, no. of the salt. No, no, concentration, oh, concentration of salt. Of salt. No, a minus the ratio that is A minus to for A. PK, for an acid, it is defined like this. We'll come back to that. Okay, you have to have the pH. pK huh? and pH are connected by the salt and the yeah, yeah, relation. So this is the okay. Uh, there is a connection. You know, we have to go to henderson hesselbach equation for that, right? Okay, but this is just a very simple way of looking. Okay, now take HCl and put it in water. It readily gives away its proton, and the pK is minus seven. But you put it in DMSO, another solvent. Its pK is two. Uh, I would say not so readily gives away. If you didn't astone at least 10.3, doesn't give away the proton at all. Okay. Now the question is that why this one molecule is giving ready to give away depending on who is okay. Mera dost hai ya nahi hai, whatever that kind of question that it arise it thinks of in mind. Okay. Now what we thought was this. Let us look at if we can somehow think of electric fields as a way to. Look at it. So what we did is we did field titration. So what we looked at is lots of water molecules in different configurations around and evaluated the electric field along the HCl bond. And what you get is a titration curve. And the point of inflection in this, okay, somewhere here, okay, will give you what I will call as a critical electric field. And what does it mean? It means that if a solvent configuration can somehow you know, project a field that is excess of this critical electric field, the proton will get transferred, otherwise it will not run. So I know the answer, yes and no now. The question is, how do I evaluate those? Okay. 
So if I can somehow get a solvent configuration which says, okay, in this case, 190 megavolt per centimeter inverse. If I have, oh, does it give me 190? Yes, no, no. So it's an auction in, the, in some sense, okay? So a solvent configuration must reduce at least X amount of critical, uh, a critical field, which is excess of critical electric field to the transfer, okay? And then I'm comparing with, so this is about 100 odd. And to compare, I've shown is that the electric field or the first bore radius of a hydrogen atom is about 5 point, around 5 gigavolt per second. So it is way less than atomic fields. Okay. And that's probably the reason why it doesn't ionize, auto ionize, okay. because it's at least 20 times less than the fields that you're talking about. No, no, this is just configurational space that you generate. Yeah, yeah, it's cluster of water molecules. You can see different arrangements of water molecules I put. So I've given examples, no? So uh, for 108, somewhere here, the water configuration looks like this. For 196, which is somewhere here, the water configuration looks like this. For 224, which is here, the water configuration looks like this. Okay, so these are essentially uh, titrations as a function of configurational space that water can rearrange, arrange itself around the HCl molecule. No, no, no. This, this we have. A, I'll come to. No, no. This is we started thinking in terms of because see, four water molecules was a. See, we were think, trying to understand that experiment that I told you. Why do you need four water molecules? Because four water molecules is the minimum number of molar molecules that you will need to transfer the proton. Because that's when the critical electric, the value goes above the critical electric fields. No, we have done it in bulk water as well. Okay. To if I want me to explain, I will do it before uh, this. But think of it like this. Okay. You have a bulk solvent. Okay. And your HCl mole will dive deep into this solvent, and then realizes that it has lost the proton, because initially at t is equal to zero, that could be as short as possible. Okay. It had this, but the solvent fluctuates. When the solvent fluctuates, it must generate configurations that will have field more than critical electric fields. So those solvent fluctuations will take away that proton. Okay. Right. I don't care about the and that's what I'm going to show as well. Okay. Okay. Yes, it doesn't. See, we have also shown it depends on, there are a lot of parameters, depends on bond, bond polarization. So, you know, I don't, there are so many, you know. See, you see, you see, it's a dialogue, okay? There is there is no solute. The solvent solvent has its own fluctuations, okay? As similar water, it has its own fluctuations, and it uh, it can. Uh, so the question that I can ask is, what is water feeling inside water, okay? And we are trying to address this, but that number is so small that you you you, you need to sample ten power fourteen configurations before I can answer that question. Okay, I mean, of course, there are we we use some other methodologies which, but the point is that yes, everybody it's just charges around it. If I take this molecule and then there are a bunch of charges around it, it will project electric field onto it, and and what it feels in presence of those electric fields, and HCl says, okay, I like you, I'm giving away the proton. That's it. I mean, that number when it crosses that number, okay. This is HCl. Okay, I am coming to that number. So that was 190. So what we did is look at the mineral acid series, HF, HCl, HBr, HI. Okay, and here are the those titration plots. Okay, and there you can see that. And then I I plotted the critical electric field in each of this case, which is in the x-axis, and the pKa of known pKa of these, and I get a perfectly straight line. In fact, I was so surprised that it appears that I drew the line and put the points there. Okay. I was so surprised that, ah, 
when I saw this plot, we were jumping with joy, pumping our fists, saying that, wow, we know now what is the microscopic definition of PKA. PKA is that point where the molecule will feel this amount of electric field. Okay, and that was a very short-lived pimp uh, because is it a microscopic definition of PK? If it is indeed microscopic definition of PK, then I should be able to give PKs out, you know, I should dole out PKs as if, you know, from my pocket for nothing. Here came our biggest jolt. Okay, before that, now this very important what, so, so essentially it is a jugalbandi, I mean, right word I would call is a jugalbandi between the solute and solvent, okay? Now, if you can see this plot here, I'm just going to emphasize on this one, don't look at it. This is three water molecules, uh, like a, a crown and HCl molecule or HBr molecule or HI molecule are sitting on the top. Proton only gets transferred when is HBr, not when HCl, not when it HI. Okay. Now what you can say is that, now you can think of it like this, HCl needs higher field, HI needs lower field than HBr, HBr is right in the middle. That's what you know. HBr is between HCl and HI, but the proton transfer happens only in case of HCl because now one of the ways to look at it is that these three water molecules have the right bite size. Okay, that configuration has right bite size only to bite HC, HBr and no other molecule. So now when I say three water molecule, four water molecules, these are, of, are just numbers that I'm saying, they're inconsequential. Okay, because why is it that someone in the middle, middle works, okay, it doesn't, when you slightly grow the size, it doesn't slight or slightly decrease the size. Doesn't. So it is just right size. And this right size makes it go over the critical electric. So essentially, it's a solute solvent interaction that plays back and forth to be able to do this exercise. Okay, now, if you give me a configuration, what is this configuration going to tell? This is my solute. I want to, I want to change the solute with this solute. Will it change? I don't know the answer a priori, but I know one thing for sure that it won't be the same. Okay. And this is probably the question that, you know, uh, uh, gives answer to partly to your question that you are asking. Yes. Huh. Okay. Now the problem is that how do I get data points right? I mean, I can only pick what is available. You know, you are right, but then, you know, but there are many, many, uh, you're right, there are one, the two are very close, but the two are close, but not good enough. Yeah, 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 because this water network is more or less intact. That identical, okay? Water network is more or less intact. It's just that on from the top, who is coming? Okay, and when? Okay, that depends on, see, uh, uh, so when we have this, uh, uh, when we have this uh, titration curves, okay, when you get a point of a point of inflection, you also know the distance. So distance of migration is what you call it as a uh, critical distance as well. So it has to be above that. So uh, for, for HCL, it would be about 1.6 angstroms. We chose HCL as well. This is HCl, this is HBr, this is HI. No, no, HF is far too away, you know, far too away. You can see in your own data, HF is very, very far away. But these three are in the ballpark figure, so. Right. Uh, so it's a, uh, even if you keep the configuration up here, so this con what is this configuration space? The configuration space is not just a solute, uh, solvent. But it is a kind of an interplay between solvent and solute interactions, and 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 then it is it's very it can be very specific. Okay, it's like you know we say uh, okay colloquially what we say. वैसे तो मैं नहीं करता लेकिन तुम्हारे लिए कर दूँगा something like that. Oh yes. Is there a way of putting a particle and measuring this? Thing? Measuring it, sir? Like measure the local speed. Huh, okay, okay. There are experiments that can do it. Okay. okay. Uh, for example, one uh, you can measure the HCL frequency, and there is a star field. Right. Okay. So that's the experiments that uh, Steve Boxer is trying is doing. It has been doing. Okay. So there is an experimental. I'm I'm just building a model out of his experiments and other experiments. Okay. So there is a 
there is an experimental, they may not have experiments on this system, but there is gen in general experiments that are possible. Yeah, sure. So um, there are these star periods. Right. Which that means which tells you that given the bond length, or not, not given the bond length, given the bond frequency, if I start uh, putting electric field, Depending on the atoms and the, the bonding character, how much it will be polarized by the field. So, or that means the frequency is going to shift with respect to the field. Mm -hmm. Now, shouldn't you look at that star tuning rate for HCl, HF, and H, uh, whatever, and see a linear correlation? If that is, uh, that, and will that be correlated to your gate? If I draw a straight line there, I will get a stock tuning rate, which I haven't done it, but it's doable. Same that the fluctuations in the charges in the in the system, so the new solvent, are what are causing these things? Yes, 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 yes. Fluctuations. Fluctuations. Okay. So if I reduce the fluctuation, no, but then you have frozen geometry. No, it's not Huh. I mean, uh, see, then, no, no. So, so then one can think of field autocorrelation time, okay? Or depending on what you want, you want to. If you want to take water on HCl, then you can look at cross correlation. Or if you want to water water, you can take autocorrelation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right, right, right. Uh, uh, but since I am, uh, uh, I want to at least get to one answer, and then we can discuss this. By the way, we have done the temperature dependent study and showed you that there is a entropy enthalpy compensation. But I'll come to that in a minute. Okay. Okay. So now came the biggest, biggest surprise that we said, let's change the solvent. Okay. Why water? You know, we then we looked at four different solvents: water, methanol, ammonia, and DMSO, and we find in this case that. The average field is about this. It doesn't matter, okay? Even though if you go from water is minus seven, DMS or PK is two, that is about nine orders of magnitude changing in dissociation constant, but your field is 193 and 180. Completely made no sense to us because we were, they told you, you know, we were thumping that PK. So PK is, so there is something else that determines the PK, okay? Now, to because I'm run, I, I okay. We looked at many many aspects, role of confinement, and you know uh, how the dynamics work. Okay, here is what I want to tell you: is this okay? By the way, uh, this time is not real time. Okay, this is some sense of time because when you do a uh, canonical ensemble using uh, methodologies that are given, the time is not real anymore because what you do is you you kind of fix the velocities at each time step. So the time is, but it has a, some sense of time. It could be proportional or it could be some function of the real time, but it's not really real time. So what we see in this case is that when you want to transfer a proton, the solvent is fluctuating around it and the field raises and then field raises to above, a, above the critical electric field and the proton says, huh, there is a field which is more than what I need, I must move now. So there's a time lag. Okay, I told you in this case, typically 30, 40 femtoseconds or less, but this time log is not real, but all I know there's a time lag. It says that the field, the proton moves when you create that field after some lag time. Okay, and so the electrical field must raise above the, you know, above some value, and then, I mean, I, I sound like a preacher, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> electric field must raise above some value for the proton to transfer, okay? Dash oh, uh, the dashed line is the field, and, uh, and the solid line is the proton movement. And the dashed line always goes ahead, and the proton line moves, uh, follows it, okay? These are, uh, uh, cano oh, this is, by the way, in the bulk, bulk okay? Uh, so this is a canonical ensemble. Uh, so the time is not real because you use something called uh, velocity. MD. It's MD. Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, I can't get that. I, I cannot, I will get you that name. Uh, it's Okay, so uh, 
having done that, I'm going to skip one thing and I want to show one last piece of data is this. Okay. There, what I did is that I took water, uh, I took HCl and put it in different solvents. Okay. And I know the field is coming out to be literally this very similar. So that cannot be the real pKa. Field cannot be, but it is some must, must be related. And here we did some slightly different. So we looked at two uh, different acids, acetic acid and trifluoroacetic acid. The OH group is with, so essentially have the very similar structure. And one of them, now this E naught, that is a critical electric field for one of them is 254 and one of them is 237, marginally lower. But if you look at these, the acetic acid at 4.76 pKa and trifluoroacetic acid. But by looking at these numbers, I would say this must be trifluoroacetic acid and this must be acetic acid. Just guessing because I don't know the data, but that's exactly the other way around. Okay. So a stronger acid could need a larger field. Okay. Now came the confusion. So what does it mean? It means that it is stronger acid because the solvent fluctuations, even though number needs to be larger, the, but the solvent fluctuations are allowing it to happen. And this happens only because A is not same as B. If A is allowed, that kind of situation arises because even though it, it needs more field, but it says, hey, Paul, I can do it for you. So the solvent does it for it. Okay. So now comes my biggest question. Then what does PK mean? PK simply means that if I take all the configurational space and I can divide them into two sets, these are the configurations that will allow the proton transfer and these are the configuration that doesn't allow the proton, the ratio of it will determine the pKa. Now the question is that how many configurations are useful? So uh, with my, one of my friend, we are using this uh, methodology called uh, pattern recognition. And we have generated about 2 million configurations. Just one minute. I'm done with it. 2 million configurations. And we are still not approaching the PKA value. So uh, then I think uh, this is configurationally very demanding. How many configurations are needed? And by the way, all these are Boltzmann weighted. So we still don't know what is the right number of configurations. We can get the right number. Okay, And we want to be right for the right reason. So that's the quest in progress. Uh, all this work took about, we started in 2014, 2024 is almost about 10, I've summed up about 10 years of our work on very simple concept of proton transfer. Okay, so this is what I said. What determines PK is the configuration of solute solvent inter space. And it's a proportion of configurations that allow the transfer versus that don't allow the transfer. Okay, so. Now, when does a proton move? Coming back, the question that I posed is that it will move when it sees that there is a field that is in excess of critical electric field around it and is happy to move. Uh, I thank my students and my group members. By the way, I didn't take a penny for this, uh, working on this. You know, it was free because of, I didn't put it there, National Computation Mission, uh, Param Brahma and Param Kamarupa. Uh, facilities that gave me a lot of computational time and uh, of course a lot of time time is money for all the students who worked on this project and I thank you all for your kind attention by the way you know this company you no know, Britannia and company very famous restaurant if you haven't been there please go have lunch one of these days <laughs> very polo very polo right okay thank you thank you Naresh. yeah Ankana, you okay a question. questions Sorry, uh, I Questions. wanted to finish uh, before the clock struck five stop. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. When you look at TFA versus acetic acid, uh -huh. the nature that you have CF3 versus CH3, right? right? That that will also have to do with the proton affinities and other things, not just like the configurations and the solid solvent. No, no, no. See, uh, see, if if you think of uh, one way to think of is that if I were to break that OH bond to O minus and H plus, I mean, mm -hmm. the anion versus and the proton, mm -hmm. okay? What is the amount of energy that I need to spend on it, okay? But that will be also affected by whether you have CF3 versus That's CF3. exactly what I'm saying, yes. that that number is going to be changing with CF3. Yeah. It, it turns out that in that particular case, CF3 is more expensive to break that bond, mm -hmm. okay? And that's why you need higher electric field. 
electric field is okay but the question is that in spite of that it needs higher electric field it still has more number of useful configurations that will transfer the proton okay and that's where you know it doesn't matter i, I have lot of money it doesn't matter how expensive something is if i, I will if i if i can afford it i will afford it so it's that kind of scenario that leads to this proton transfer yeah no? Configurations or the dynamics of that configuration also affects. You no, know? if some configuration is not favorable, but it's like a billiard ball. You said in the before, like it might uh, take away the proton um, through the dynamics. Like, like it's like. So okay, uh, the, the last data that I was showing you is on dynamics. Okay, if you don't hit the billiard ball in right way, uh, uh, then you are not going to. Uh, uh, you are not go going to achieve your goal. So essentially, you need to, I mean, you have to hit it in the right way. And that right way is only when you get to feel that is excess of critical electric field. There's, there cannot be any other way. Even if you... No, that is the analogy that I get. Of course, molecules are not billiard okay. balls, you know. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Even if the configuration is accurate, it may not come because of lack of dynamics. No, no. Uh, so essentially, uh, we have looked at uh, total number of configurations we would have looked at up till now could be millions, okay? More than 2 million for sure, because I worked on one molecule with 2 million snapshots, okay? So uh, it's not, we have not seen it. As of now, answer is emphatic no, but uh, who knows the future? No. Uh, my question is, uh... So what I didn't understand is how do you how you are cho choosing the configurations, and when you choose one particular configuration, are you also considering some local fluctuations around that configuration? Uh, in most of the cases, I don't choose configurations. I take configurations. See, for example, if you do, if you run an MD, I have no control on its st stochastic methodology. It gives just gives me configuration. So I take any configuration that comes my way, and then bin them into to do or not to do okay so and when it is done oh by the way we look we do something called a show md where proton transfers can happen okay bonds can break it's a it's basically uh on the fly abinitio calculations for a classical on a on a classical md trajectory you can think of it that way very uh it's not that simple, but it it is can be grossly so i am not really picking any configurations I'm, I take any configuration that comes my way. It's uh, like uh, bulk water and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we run these simulations for, you know, uh, I should tell you the longest simulation we have done is one millisecond. Okay, so that is uh, 100 million snapshots, but we have not analyzed the data yet, but I have the trajectory for it. Um, Sorry, you can, I mean, see, JD is uh, biased, biased against you, okay. No, there's no bias. <laughs> yeah, so I have uh, two questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, one is when you're looking at the dynamics, you see that there is a lag time, there is a lag time between the electric field and the proton transfer. Right. Suppose uh, before the proton transfer occurs, is it possible that the system achieves some other configuration where the electric field is lower and then you just do not see like it's a yeah, transient I can species show a lot of such data it goes up and comes down then the proton does it doesn't happen i may i can in fact i see in that in many many times okay and only sometimes i get and what we were trying to do in this case was to see if we have some kind of a uh can uh determine an autocorrelation function tells you how slowly it has to move but unfortunately the time scale is so small that any autocorrelation function is not uh, statistically valid. Okay. And the second question is... Okay. I mean, we can talk outside on the cap. So what I was thinking of is uh, uh, this electric field idea along the bond. Uh, don't you think that there is a parallel between this and thinking of the problem as a bound state and a dissociated state of the acid 
and you talk about the energy gap difference between these two states, these two diabats, and those uh, solvent uh, uh, configurations which make the energy gap a zero, as in make the energies equal, those would allow for the transfer. Actually, I have a very simple explanation for that. It doesn't have to be so involved. So the bond is you know, some kind of a Morse potential. I put electric field. And when it crosses cro crosses the uh, critical electric field, it goes down. Right? So there is a spontaneous proton transfer. In fact, we uh, we are trying to evaluate, get this uh, potential shape okay? based on metadynamics. Uh, we have some cases, but uh, it essentially will. Uh, I I have probably not shown it, but I can show you that we all we know that it's it's just. A, by the way, we can, right now as of now we can only talk about spontaneity. We are not at there for reaction rates, which we are building a model above this. But give me another five years, and I'll come back for a colloquium on that. Okay, uh, Ravi. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Koti also had some question. Yeah. Uh, so regarding this. Uh, because your definition of PK is favorable ratio of favorable to unfavorable solvent configurations, right? So for that, right. you're trying to do pattern matching. Uh -huh. But why do you have to go to pattern matching? Because you have the electric fields. And using the electric fields, you can you just have a time series data. And from that, can't you get the ratios? Of no, no, but see, there is a problem with that. Because once the proton transfer, that trajectory is no, no longer useful for me. See, you know, because those configurations, so I want to generate config. So see, my problem uh, in this, the way we are looking at this problem is that I'm only making contact ion pairs. That's it, just move. But once you make the contact and you run your trajectory, this proton is diffusing away. And that trajectory is useless for me. So I'm only have to look at that part of them. So which means I have to build so many of those, my trajectories that, you know, I'll just spend, uh, spend time and energy on trying to get those vast number of trajectories that's why we need we need a slightly different way to solve this problem and that's why we are using pattern recognition as a way to look at it i will explain a little bit more but uh, believe me that is what we are doing now no my trajectories are classical no 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 uh, the classic uh, we are uh, sorry my trajectories are on the fly on the fly i've been issue so that's why once a proton leaves it leaves okay i can't so once it proton get transferred, that trajectory is essentially useless for me. Uh, so if I understood correctly, you have this, let's say, HCl in water, and then because of fluctuation, it is sampling all these configurations. And if you have the correct configuration, it uh, ionizes. Right. So what are the, the lifetime of each of this configuration? Uh, okay. <laughs> And is the lifetime the same? The lifetime would yeah, be different. For very yeah, different. yeah. I mean, see, uh, uh, solvent orientation um, happens in sub picosecond time scale. Okay, but that is only if you define your autocorrelation function for a solvent and it decays, decays down. But the instantaneous fluctuation can happen at okay tens of. I mean let's say five to 10 femtosecond time scale. Okay, and that is very fast, okay? In fact, that is much faster. In fact, we have, uh, okay, that right now I don't have the sense, I told you, no, because the way we do this calculation, uh, the, our time is not real time, okay? Hmm. So un unless I do, you know, microcanonical ensemble. But you have relative time would be. Yeah, yeah, fine. relative, but I don't know what is that relative time it actually means in terms of time, okay? Hmm. So unless we have a, 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 a Unless we have, you know, good quality data using a microcanonical ensemble calculations, uh, I won't be able to tell exact time it will take. But we are trying to get to that. Uh, this is the question that we also have in our mind, but for which I don't have a straightforward answer. I see. So a related question is that you take all this configuration, but these are sort of, let's say, configuration that have a lifetime of whatever you yeah. you. Don't know. A few femtoseconds for time linear, you can think exactly. of few femtoseconds. What about non equilibrium configuration during the transition? Those uh, configuration could have even had electric field. By the way, uh, all our distribution holds only if it is equilibrium thermodynamics. Nice. Okay. okay. And I, I mean, non equilibrium thermodynamics is a good idea, but uh, I have to talk to P. I mean, we have to figure out, but as of now, it's a completely equilibrium system, or equilibrium thermodynamics. 
Yeah, so I think uh, related to that equilibrium. Oh, by the way, I must remind you, I'm an experimentalist. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's say because you have now millions of configurations. So uh, because the picture you projected is basically kind of sigmoidal transitions, so yeah. either all or none above threshold value, something like that. But because you are saying that its equilibrium picture is more important. So what is the distribution of the fields when you sample more and more and more configurations? You know, uh, it's, it's, yeah. So it becomes more and more Gaussian. Correct, correct. But it should have a certain um, average and uh, deviation, deviation, right? So how is that related to the basically proton transfer? Okay, uh, I know this. Uh, this I can tell you without any. Uh, see if proton is not getting transferred. The distributions are very narrow around you know uh, that bond. But if if you do quite a, a nice law. Uh, I would say uh, thousands at least, uh, sorry, not thousands, tens of thousands. Okay, Then what you see, you'll start seeing a double, a double distribution of, you know, uh, so there is, you start separating, uh, what we feel is that you, st you have nice non-transferred states versus transferred states, and you can actually get the population out of it. But this population must finally, if I take the areas under this curve, okay, must actually give me directly the PK readout. Okay, if I would have sampled, uh, if my sampling was um, what I would care is a quote unquote uh, statistically viable, but right now we don't see that. So which means the, I have not sampled enough, or I have not. So there is see there is sampling has enough problems because uh, this is what I was talking to you and your students. This also is basin. If if there are populations in other basins that I am not able to sample, okay, then I will I have to find ways to get into that basin and start sampling. And if this is the problem that I am facing, which may be one of the reasons that we have not been able to, is that we have excluded some basins on the um, configuration landscape, which I need to go and start populating and looking at their populations. If if I am hundred percent sure of this. Uh, sampling over the entire landscape, or inclu which includes all the basins, then I should definitely get to that number. But we don't get to that number because most probable reason is loss of base. Uh, I mean, we have not seen all the basins that we need to see. Yeah, uh, just a small question. What is the displacement of proton you consider to be the proton transfer? Oh, it depends on the molecule. For example, if you take phenol, that is 1.3. That comes from the sigmoidal curve that we fit, okay? You have a point of inflection, you know what distance it is moved at that, that point of inflection because the, the plot is field versus distance, that's it. So you know inflection, so above that distance, it must move. So for phenol, it will be 1.3 angstrom, for HCl, it will be 1.6 angstrom, for HF, it will be around 1.28 angst or 25 angstroms. So this depends on the molecule, but it is of, I mean, that number is defined for a given molecule, but for all OH bonds, it's typically around 1.3 angstroms. For all uh, H, uh, for all NH bonds, it's defined. So those those there are some ballpark figures. Okay, it might slightly win, but then I can always say there is a ballpark figure for a given type of bond that much proton must move before I can say it's transferred. Any other, any other questions? Well, if there are none, I think there are people who are waiting for with more questions. So, Naresh, thank you very much yeah. for doing the colloquium even when you are sick. So, thank you uh, for doing that. Thank, thank you all for coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we will have some uh, tea and snacks outside. <laughs>